Hey, this is Pam Perry, and welcome to the Speakers Magazine show. And also shout out to Amazon Live and shout out to LinkedIn Live. Uh, I am having a guest today who has a book coming out, but we're going to be talking to her about all sorts of things that have to do with diversity. Uh, Dr. Tracy Crump, Tracy G. Crump, um, rising from adversity, Dr. Tracy G. Crump has emerged as a beacon of knowledge and inspiration for students and educators. As a founder and chief education officer, CEO, right, at Tracy Crump Enterprises, LLC, Dr. Crump has dedicated her life to clarifying her clients' goals, uh, honing their skills, and empowering them to reach success. She is an award-winning educator who has taught for almost two decades at various colleges and universities. She's a sought after speaker who gives impactful presentations on domestic violence, victimology, college prep, which we'll talk about, academic navigation, diversity, equity, inclusion, belongingness, and justice, D-E-I-B-J. But one of the things though, um, with a lifetime of education behind her, Dr. Crump really embodies really a transformative power of learning. Matter of fact, one of the things that she says on her website is that continue learning isn't a suggestion. It's a requirement. She has faced herself countless of challenges in her years of study, but refused to let adversity stand in the way of her dreams. On the contrary, she has struggled to navigate her way to success, whether by completing off-campus courses during high school or preparing for the bar exam. She honed her problem-solving skills through her trials and triumphs, bringing that experience to students and educators today. At the heart of it, Dr. Crump's mission is a simple but powerful idea. Everyone has the potential to achieve greatness no matter what the obstacles stand in their way. She is living proof of that principle. Through her words, her actions, her books, which are coming out, she encapsulates all the immense work experience. She inspires others to believe in themselves and to reach for success. So with that, I'm going to bring up Dr. Trump. Yay! <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank you. You know, one of the things I want to ask you, Dr. Tracy, is what are some of the obstacles that you face? What were what were some of those obstacles? You know, we talked about oh the the trials and the triumphs. What were some of the trials? Because we hear all the accolades, but give us a little bit of that backstory. Yes. Well, Dr. Pam, first and foremost, thank you so much for having me today. Um, this is truly an honor. I have followed your inspiration for quite some time, so I am honored to be here. Um okay. I, and thank you for reading the bio. Yes, I am Tracy G. Crump from Tracy Crump Enterprises, LLC, where I help students and educators prosper by clarifying their goals and resources and sharpening their skills. Um, some of the adversity that I faced, oh, where should we begin? Um, <laughs> I had my daughter very early in life. And so I had to navigate parenting while I was navigating my first year of college. Wow. Yeah. I don't know, right? You you may have been in a spot where you were a genius and had all of the resources, but that navigation for me was not straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, I also worked during that time. And so being a full-time student, being a full-time parent and being a full-time employee was really difficult for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I am also a first generation everything so first generation college student and grad, first generation law school and grad, first generation a PhD and grad. So wow. that was really a, a time where I had to do some self-reflection. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And during those times, what I noticed was when I didn't have focus, when I didn't have access to my resources, when I didn't have discipline, I didn't do well. I didn't thrive. And so I began to develop what we now will talk about later as ACEs, my ACEs framework, which means the A is being achievement driven. So right, mm -hmm. looking within to find out what it is that I want, what is my goal? 
Mm -hmm. The C stands for being capacity informed, which means examining your capabilities and your resources. The E stands for enthusiasm oriented, which means how can I stay motivated? And the S means being skill building focused, which means how can I work on improving myself? Mm -hmm. Once I was able to hone those skills, then I was off to the races. Um, now, there is nothing I do better than navigate college. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's one of the main things. So when you had your, um, were you raising your, your, your child as a single parent? Yes. So a single parent, full-time parent, full-time in school, full-time employee, all of those things. And then not just like, okay, I'm going to finish with my undergraduate, but then you went on to law school. Then you went on to the PhD. It's like, well, what drives you? What was it that really was the inspiration? If you're the first generation of it in the, in terms of your family, what, um, are you the oldest? Are you the youngest, the middle child? Like, did you have, you know, where did the inspiration come from? If you, they always say, if you can see it, you can be it. Yes. So, but you didn't really see it if you're the first of doing it. So where did you fall in the family and where did that uh, focus and determination come from? Yes. So I am a, the youngest of the my youngest. siblings. Yes. Okay. I'm the youngest of my siblings. My brother is about 10 years older than me and wow. my sister is about eight years older than me. Yes. Now you're really, you were the youngest, youngest. <laughs> I was the youngest, youngest. By the time I could see straight, they were on their way. So for me, mentorship and some of my amazing teachers, I, I have to pay homage to them daily because mm -hmm. if it were not for uh, their guidance, I would not have known what to do. Uh, they placed me in positions that allowed me to see things beyond my immediate environment mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. see that if we had resources, there were things that we could do. So being able to be exposed to them and all of the resources, I knew there was something other than right my immediate existence. And that's what, what drove me in the beginning. Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. lived on the south side of Chicago. Um, which we had a wonderful community and we were tight knit and everyone looked out for one another. But when we started to travel for academic games, one of my um, wonderful mentors got us enrolled in me and some of my peers enrolled in the academic games. I started to see the resources that ah. other students had at their schools that we didn't have. Now, mm -hmm. don't get it twisted. We were ferocious and right. We were knocking down teams all over the, the, the <laughs> state, but the resources they had allowed their preparation to go a little smoother, yes. um, allowed them to dig a little deeper in understanding the content. Once I figured that out, I started to ask questions about the resources and mm. how do we get the resources and why don't we get the resources? And at every stage in my academic career and my professional career, I ask myself those questions. What is my goal? What resources do I have? Mm -hmm. What is my capacity? And how do I get the resources that I need? Mm, that is so at, at such a young age, realizing that, right? Mm -hmm. Not just going along, getting along. So what were you reading? What other books besides the school books were you reading that inspired that? Were you raised in the church? Were you, you know, you had the mentors, but then there has to be some other kind of uh, personal development or, or self-motivation besides that. I just interviewed not too long ago, um, Peggy McCall, and Peggy was talking about uh, one of her mentors, Bob Proctor from The Secret, and how she heard him speak one time. And then she became really like almost like consumed with personal development type of books. And she was reading them all the time. And eventually she went on to write like 21 personal development books because she realized how transformative that has been. So what were you reading? What were some of the books that inspire you now or even then? So very early on, I could remember reading Nikki Giovanni. I could mm -hmm. remember um, reading Toni Morris. Oh, Toni Morrison. Um, I could mm -hmm. remember reading Maya Angelou. And so distinctly, I know why the cage birds sing. 
changed my life and my perspective. Yes, yes. There's someone in Chicago. I want to say, is it Brooke? It's in Bronzeville, and there's a big statue of her in Bronzeville. She's a writer. I want to say Gwendolyn Brooks. Gwendolyn Brooks, yes. Yes, right. right. Yes. Gwendolyn Brooks. And I remember, I didn't realize that she was from Chicago, from mm -hmm. that Bronzeville area. And I remember going there and seeing her picture, and I just, she was like one of the writers. So you named a lot of um, female writers, you know, yeah. Toni Morrison, my angel, Nikki Giovanni, who I've met. I was just fa a fangirl when I met Nikki Giovanni because it was like, I remember reading you, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and in and, and, and junior high and that sort of thing. And she was like, yeah, so name some of my poems. I was like, ah, I don't remember. I said, but I do remember that you, <laughs> that it was like the first African-American poet that I really knew. And that is so important. You know, when, when we are, you're talking about the academic games and you're traveling to different places and you don't see anybody that looks like you, it's really good to read about them in books. So your book is coming out. It's on pre-order right now. People can actually order it now or pre-order it now for the ebook. And when will the actual book be out? The actual book book. The actual book book comes out May 16th of this okay. year. Okay. Yes. But they can get the other book now. They can um, pre-order the ebook right now, and then they'll be able to pre-order the print book April 5th. Okay. Okay. So April 5th, that's coming up. So this is your first book. And a lot of times, a lot of authors are, you know, their first book is the hardest. What? Um, why did you decide to write this book at this point at this time? Yes. You know, we're two years out of the pandemic and, you know, you could, you know, so it's always interesting to hear when authors, when they decide they want to write their first book. So this book has actually been in the making for over 17 years. Uh, what I have noted throughout my teaching career, my students did not have challenges with understanding my content. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I could teach criminal justice in my sleep. That was not the problem. What the problem was came from students not being able to navigate college. And mm -hmm. so I had been taking notes and writing outlines and giving these impromptu mini lectures with every course, right? Maybe six times per semester for the last 17 years. Okay. During the pandemic, as we all did, I had to sit myself down. And so I decided to, instead of creating space in the class to have these six separate lectures, I would just put them all into a handy primer, if you will. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As I started to write the primer, though, it grew and grew and grew. And I was like, this is too much for students. And I let one of my mentors read it. And my mentor said, this is a manuscript. Mm. And, and I stepped back and I said, this is a manuscript. And I thought about why would I put a manuscript out at this time? And I came up with, I wanted to help 1 million students confidently enter college, knowing their goals, understanding their resources and feeling that they were prepared to seize their destinies by activating their ACEs. Mm -hmm. And that is how the book was born. Uh, the pandemic, however, did shine a light on some much needed attention that yeah. needs to be paid to several areas that I do cover in the book. Okay. Yeah, because a lot of times students, and we always learn about this too, that when a student graduates from high school, they made the first two years get scholarships and things like that, because usually they want students to get into the school. So there are a lot more scholarships available for students the first two years. The third and fourth year, not so much from the outside. They're probably within the inside, but the money still is old, right? So a lot of the African-American students may have a problem with the money of going to school. And so now they're struggling, they're working, they're, they're worried about it the last two years. So they went for the first two years and then the last two, maybe their junior and senior year, scholarships aren't equally as available. And then they get distracted by so many other things and they drop out. So your book really helps them navigate what to expect because usually in high school, you're told what to do, but in college, you're not told what to do. You really got to figure it out on your feet. And so the, the, explain the, uh, the acronym again for those that are just tuning in. 
Yes. So my proprietary framework is ACES. It means being achievement driven, mm -hmm. capacity informed, enthusiasm oriented and skill building focused. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the mm -hmm. things that I love about the framework is that it deals with intrapersonal barriers. So okay. oftentimes as students, we can understand how to navigate some things external to us, but we don't do a lot of self-reflection, specifically no. early on. So those intrapersonal barriers, they, they play a role in how we navigate the world, right? They play a role in um, our sense of belonging and our persistence and commitment and right that grit that you must have in order to negotiate your way through college. And then they also uh, kind of digging in deep, it plays a role in several social psychological phenomena, including imposter syndrome and mm. stereotype threat and navigating intersectionality and overall mindset. And so if students don't have a grasp on at least understanding that those social psychological phenomena exist and what resources can help them, it makes for navigating college hard. Mm -hmm. It also makes it difficult to access additional resources after mm -hmm. that first and second year. Right. And so when you are, um, what are some of the courses that you teach? So you have the, the part, I guess you would say, the soft skills where you're helping students really navigate college, but what do you actually teach? Like you said, they didn't really have a problem understanding and grasping the content. So what were you, what are some of the courses that you teach in school? And then some of the things that I guess people hire you for as well. Okay. So in school, uh, I am a criminologist. So I teach all of the criminal justice courses from introduction to criminal justice to capstone and senior seminar. And that includes some of my faves. I teach serial killers. Well, wait a minute, let me back up. I don't teach serial killers. I teach the course serial killers. Uh, I love teaching research methods and design because I love to research. I also love teaching some of the um, courses that deal with mental health, mental mm -hmm. challenges and the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. And I teach police legitimacy. So policing um, mm -hmm. as part of college courses, but I also partner with other organizations to do a lot of their managing implicit bias and um, inclusive policing trainings. Wow. Um, That's probably been really, really over the last two years, especially since the murder of George Floyd and of many others uh, that has been a subject that has been um, of interest that a lot, Minneapolis seems like a place where a lot of that is training is really needed. Uh, and I could see the last two years have it been more busy for you than of recent. I mean, you've been doing this for a while with the last two, it seems like it's been an epidemic. So for, for me, it's been a little longer than uh, two years. So about 2018, I saw a, a, a jump in requests for managing implicit bias courses for law enforcement. Uh, but after you are absolutely correct, after um, the murder of George Floyd, we saw mm -hmm. a huge jump mm -hmm. in uh, request for these facilitations. And so, yes, we did increase uh, that. We also increased our uh, DEI strategic planning for law enforcement. And so I do a lot of my work with law enforcement and with colleges and universities as well as uh, equity assessments and intercultural team consults. Mm -hmm. And something new that I had to develop uh, shortly after uh, the conviction of George Floyd's murderer was um, a course that dealt with um, managing microaggressions mm -hmm. because a lot of people didn't understand the implications of microaggressions, right? Oh, they're just minor um, aggressive behavior. They're, they don't mean anything, but they were looking at intent and not impact. If mm -hmm. you get cut a thousand times and those cuts don't heal and the, uh, the scabs are constantly being ripped off, right? It can harm you irreparably. So mm -hmm. yes, a, a lot of requests for managing uh, microaggressions and how to navigate in the workplace. Explain microaggressions in the the old <laughs> when I, when I worked in corporate. I guess you would call microaggressions things that um, 
racist remarks and things like that, but give some examples of like microaggressions, what defined the, 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 the uh, academic term, uh, I guess you would say, what people would define as microaggressions. Yes. So generally, a microaggression is uh, more commonly known as a daily verbal slight uh, mm. it can come off as being something that is not nefarious, but it has harmful impact. So, for example, um, in several situations, and I'll tell you a sh short story in a moment, several situations I've heard, oh, you're pretty for a dark skinned girl mm. or, oh, okay. you're really smart for a woman. Oh, yeah. or, um, oh, you're a criminologist. Right. Um, I do remember my very first time presenting as a graduate student. I was the keynote speaker and I was all ready to go. I was excited. I went to the conference hall and I sat down and I was preparing myself. And an older gentleman who was not of my ethnic persuasion sat down next to me. And um, we were quiet for a moment and he tapped me on my arm. Mm -hmm. um, that was the first thing. I'm like, I don't know you, sir. Uh, but he tapped me on my arm and he said, um, sugar, can you go get me some coffee? Oh, yeah. my God. What things what wrong year was me? this? This was in 2006 because I was in grad school. Yes. Oh my God. 2006. Oh my and God. so um, the first thing is I don't drink coffee. So I'm the last person you want making you coffee. Uh, the second thing is, right, sugar is really informal and intimate, right, language that you would use with someone you know. Mm -hmm. The third thing is, I didn't work there. I was the keynote. Mm -hmm. Luckily, the person who actually was responsible for doing that came over and um, she looked down and she was like, do you need anything to drink? And then he di redirected, didn't apologize, but redirected his question. Mm -hmm. um, shortly after, he tapped me again on my arm and said, oh, you need to really listen to this keynote speaker because you could probably learn something. And not I, realizing that you were the keynote speaker. Right, right. He said he heard things. And so at that moment, they started the program and they were announcing and reading bios and things like that. And so when they mentioned my name, I began to get up and he tapped my arm again and said, no, right. The show is about to start. And I literally had to like maneuver my way from his grip to go on stage. Now, oh I God. was built for this because the entire speech, I was tuned in on him. So <laughs> things like that, right, um, they hurt. Mm -hmm. Why would you think I wasn't fit to be in this space? Why would you think I would be the person to serve you it's coffee? coffee. So right. that's how microaggressions work, right? That yeah. people don't necessarily, now sometimes they do intend to them to have negative impact. But for those folks who don't intend them to have negative, negative impact, um, it doesn't mean that they will not have that negative impact. Mm -hmm. Wow. You can't believe in the 2000s that that just still happens and still happens today. Uh, the the whole uh, Crown Act was really, I think, probably birthed out of microaggression, you know, black women in their hair. And, and you know, I remember um, it was a uh, talk show, uh, Bertie, Bertice Berry, I believe it was her name. And she was going up against um, Oprah at the time on Oprah's talk show. And Bertice would wear braids. She would wear braids and she would wear them up. She wear them down, whatever. And people would say she's not going to last because she has braids. Black women can't wear braids on television. I'm like, where is that a rule? Like what? This was in, this was like, you know, early 2000s. And really the Crown Act didn't really become a, a real thing until late 2000s where black women just had to like get over the fact that the microaggressions about their hair happens all the time, that there has to be a rule about it. I'm like, oh my God, this is so crazy because you can't really, how do you say it? Some women just like, will just put up with it. And then there's some people that will leave the workforce because of it. Some people aren't promoted because of it. Bertice Berry, they said the reason why she left television is because she wouldn't refuse to straighten her hair. I'm like, oh my God. This is a thing. 
This yes. is the thing. So you see a lot of that, I'm sure. Yes, definitely. And and you know what um for me is it's really important to pull out of that, not only the fact that we needed legislation, because as you can see, I love my braids, I love my natural hair. Uh, but it was problematic in the workforce. I recall I was in ROTC in uh, high school and in college, and everyone else was able to wear their natural hair, except for me. I had to get it straightened and, you know, right, straightening damages it. And so it was so hurtful to not be able to show up in my full glory, right? Give you the full Tracy Crump phenomenon, right? And when we think about what that does to the psyche, that mm -hmm. you are not accepted as you are. Yes. A specific group of people being targeted. And let's not forget, it's not just uh, Black women. It also is Black men. Uh, I remember yeah. seeing a young man who was a potential wrestling champion. And he had to be in like high school or something like that. And he had beautiful dreads. And, and I remember the referee would not allow the match to continue until he cut his hair. Cut his, cut his, hair. his hair. Not put it up. Right. I remember that. That went viral on uh, Instagram or something like that. That was not too long ago. Yes, it was not too long ago. Yeah. And literally, I sat with myself and I was like, this cannot be. So the Crown Act did so many things, um, mm -hmm. put so many people on notice that right, we should be able to show up as we are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That is that is something. So how can most people, um, I guess you would say, navigate or what can they learn from uh, your services? You know, you're you're more or less like coaching, you're, you're teaching, you're coaching. So what can they find when they go to uh, Tracy Crump Enterprises, LLC.com? And yes. uh, yeah. So if they go to the website and they go to the media or press page, they will mm -hmm. have all sorts of resources. I post weekly on my LinkedIn page articles about education and about navigating college. I also post any podcasts, um, any speaking engagements that I'm allowed to record and to post on my website. Uh, when you do decide to go to the website, you can either book me for any one of the services. So a DEI consult, um, any okay. speaking engagements, or you can book me for the ACES for Students tour that will be happening this beginning this May. So I'm excited about that. Um, oh, good, good. This, yes, this is a tour where I will go to colleges and universities around the country and basically walk them through all 13 chapters of the book. So students will benefit from learning about emotional intelligence and finding their self-identity and understanding what their professor's expectations are and also navigating the relationships that mm -hmm. are part of college, whether they are personal or professional. Mm -hmm. So yes, Going to my website is the best place. Also LinkedIn, right? They can go. I am Tracy G. Krupp on LinkedIn. They can also go there and find me. Okay, cool, cool. I love it. I love it. So yeah, the tour is coming up. Uh, people can book you there, walking them through, doing the workshops and things like that. This is what you were saying. You said you were built for this. This is for sure. For this is this is it. And then your last name is Crump. So people, do they ever think that you're related? <laughs> All of the time, they say, oh, is, is Ben Crump your cousin or your right? Uncle? Right, because you've got the same kind of energy and, and the whole justice piece. It just so happens, you know. So, and yeah, we're both can, attorneys, and both attorneys, and in that whole space of really justice for and doing the, the work and everything. So, yeah, so I just appreciate you, Tracy. Thank you so much. You'll be in the magazine for. Uh, the next one. So the next time that, you know, you, we'll be following you on LinkedIn, I'm sure you'll be posting on that as well. But that that's so that people can actually book you to speak and actually do the trainings and things like that, that you always do. So thank you so much for joining Speakers Magazine family, joining the show, being on Amazon Live, LinkedIn Live, and all of that. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, John. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you. So I am Pam Perry. I am out. That was Tracy Crump Enterprises, LLC. Make sure you go there, get all the juicy good stuff there, sign up for her newsletter and everything so that you can do that. 
and then go to speakersmagazine.com. She will be in that issue. You can best basically be seeing this replay of this video again on the page as well. But thank you so much for joining us today and we will see you later. Bye.